the plight of the Lost Boys. Chaos. As told in a new brand new feature film starring Reese Witherspoon. Your character, how would you describe her? Feisty. Plus. Survival of the fetus. A track star running for his freedom. Which is incredible. With two nations on his side. Not for me, it's for them. I'm carrying this flag. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. I believe on yesterday's program, I mentioned the fact that viruses have a tendency to mutate, and they do it very subtly and very rapidly. Now there's a warning from a top official that this Ebola virus could become airborne. And uh, if it comes, the government is going to have to stop the spread of a lethal disease. It is highly contagious. It takes one drop of blood to, uh, to infect somebody. And they're trying to trace the trail now of the people who were exposed to the guy who took on a plane from Liberia and came to Dallas. And Terry has more about that. Well, up to 100 people in the Dallas area are being watched for symptoms of Ebola because they were in contact with this man from Liberia who's now in the hospital in Dallas with it. And another American has been diagnosed as well. Charlene Aaron has the story. An American cameraman covering the Ebola outbreak in Liberia for NBC News is the latest U.S. citizen stricken with the deadly virus. Ashoka Mukpu will be flown home to the U.S. for treatment. As the outbreak continues to rage, the government response both in Africa and the U.S. has been slow and questionable. The disease has already killed more than 3,000 people in Africa, and according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, there could be as many as 1.4 million cases of Ebola by January. Save the Children reports that Ebola is spreading at the rate of five new cases an hour in Sierra Leone. The chief of the United Nations Ebola mission told the London Telegraph that the international community has been a bit late to respond to the epidemic. He also said it's unlikely but possible the Ebola could mutate and become airborne. But other experts say there's no evidence that's ever happened with viruses like Ebola. But the disease can spread in other ways, in the U.S. and around the world, through travel and other means. Health officials are investigating how many people Thomas Eric Duncan might have infected. Duncan is the first ever confirmed case of Ebola on American soil. A Dallas emergency room nurse sent Duncan home despite showing symptoms and admitting he had traveled from West Africa. Duncan's nephew called the CDC after he was turned away from the hospital. I was terrified, scared, worried. The CDC has issued a nationwide alert to all hospitals in the U.S. on how to appropriately respond to possible cases of the deadly virus. But experts are confident that U.S. medical procedures will keep Ebola from running wild here. The only fatal part of it may be the guy who was, whose treatment was delayed, but it's not likely to, uh, to, to result in anything else that is, uh, you know, that's catastrophic or fatal. Duncan's family is quarantined under armed guard in their Dallas apartment. They cannot come out. Uh, they are not even allowed to come on the porch. Meanwhile, CBN's Operation Blessing remains on the ground in Liberia, providing supplies and working with area churches to teach people about prevention and treatment. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Well, in other news, it seems that the president was determined not to take the advice of his experts who surrounded him, at least the ones who said things that were different from the party line. And the party line was that he had destroyed terrorism. Osama bin Laden was dead, and therefore al-Qaeda was diminished and fading quickly from the scene, and nothing else really mattered. Now his own secretary, former secretary of defense, uh, has warned that pulling American troops out of Iraq was a terrible mistake. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. Pat, former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta says the White House didn't make a deal with Iraq's leadership in 2011 to keep troops in that country and that it could become a new haven for terrorists to plot attacks against the U.S. Panetta writes in his new book called Worthy Fights that he and others believe the president's team at the White House 
wanted to do away with the Iraq issue, and so the Obama administration was willing to pull out of the country rather than make a deal that could have preserved American influence. He also believes a small contingent of American troops could have helped the Iraqi government deal with al-Qaeda terrorists in Iraq. Pat, back to you. It's politics, ladies and gentlemen. I've said it over and over again. That's what they care about, is winning elections, getting their people in office. That's what he's doing right now. He's out politicking. He's out raising money for candidates. He's out giving speeches about the economy, things that aren't true. He says things that aren't true. Maybe he lives in a bubble. Maybe he's self-deluded, or else it's a delivered plan. But. Uh, what uh, Rush Limbaugh says is the drive-by crowd seems to be buying a lot of that stuff. But nevertheless, the American people are beginning to wonder, what are they doing? Why don't they tell us the truth? John? Pat, Republicans are criticizing President Obama for his speech on the economy Thursday. The president says under his watch, the economy has been improving, with employment down, jobs up, and gains in energy and manufacturing. Across the board, the trend lines have moved in the right direction. That's because this new foundation is now in place. The president added, even though he isn't on the ballot in this fall's congressional elections, his policies will be. But Republicans say the economic recovery under President Obama is much weaker than it was under President Reagan, and they say their own plans for fixing the economy have been ignored. Israel faces accusations of war crimes at the United Nations for its fight against Hamas terrorists. But now the Jewish state is offering an olive branch of sorts to help smooth over its often stormy relationship with the world body by suggesting that it recognize a Jewish holy day as an official UN holiday. Chris Mitchell has that story. Israel is often singled out at the United Nations for condemnation. Now the Jewish state wants the world body to do something positive recognize Yom Kippur as an official UN holiday. We thought that this was the right moment to recognize also the most important day in the Jewish calendar as being a day which belongs to the whole of humanity and not only to the Jewish people. There are 10 official holidays at the United Nations, including Christmas, Good Friday, and there's also two Muslim holidays. And there are also so-called World Days, including Buddhist holidays and the Persian New Year. But so far, no recognition of the Jewish holy days. The book of Leviticus says the day of atonement shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and you shall do no work on that same day. For it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. It's the day of atonement because Judaism at the end of the day is also at the origin of Christianity and Islam. Foreign Ministry spokesman Emmanuel Nakshon describes it as the Jewish people's legacy to humanity. It gives Judaism also its right place among the other reli important religions. About 60 countries, including the U.S. and the Christian group called the European Coalition for Israel, support Israel's request. The Jewish people should be recognized for their, their holidays. Um, Yom Kippur in particular should be a, it has a message which goes beyond Judaism. The request faces a lot of bureaucratic hurdles. It's unlikely the UN would create an 11th day off, mainly due to financial reasons. Yom Kippur could replace a US holiday like Labor Day or alternate with one of them. So far, the main objection comes from Arab states. Nakshon says recognizing Yom Kippur could help to ease relations with the UN. We are under the impression that Israel is being singled out in a variety of issues and mostly in a political context. And by giving an official recognition to the most important Jewish holiday, it will be also a step of reconciliation and it will make our belonging to the UN and our cooperation with the UN much easier. Israel and the Jewish world mark Yom Kippur this Saturday. By next year, they hope the commemoration includes the international community as well. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Pat, back to you. When pigs fly, you will see the UN acknowledge an Israeli holiday. But what does that mean? <clears throat> the word in, in Hebrew, yom, is day, 
And the uh, verb is kafar, uh, or covering. And uh, the Yom Kippur has to do with the time the high priest went into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled blood upon what was called the mercy seat. And uh, that <clears throat> settled the testimony of the law against the people. And so it was the day of covering where the mercy seat was covered by the blood. It has tremendous significance for Christians and obviously tremendous significance for Jews. Whether the Arabs and the other people will adopt it, it remains to be seen. It would be a nice gesture, but uh, who knows? I mean, miracles do happen. John? Pat, the deadly enterovirus has been sweeping the nation, mostly striking young kids. So far, four children with enterovirus have died. The CDC is investigating whether their deaths were caused by the virus or something else. CBN health reporter Lori Johnson tells us what you can do to protect your children. Enterovirus D68 usually begins with a cough, then can get much worse. Parents should immediately go to the doctor or hospital if a child has difficulty breathing or moving their arms or legs. Doctors across the country report seeing a new enterovirus symptom, paralysis. We don't understand why sometimes in some children, enteroviruses attack the nervous uh, system. The paralysis usually goes away when the child recovers from the infection. There is no specific treatment or vaccine for enteroviral infections such as this one. Doctors say the best prevention for enterovirus, the flu, and other illnesses is to keep your hands clean. Try to wash them thoroughly five or six times a day. Also, don't share drinking glasses or utensils. Try not to touch your face. Cover <laughs> your coughs and sneezes and strongly consider staying home so you don't make anyone else sick. If you're exposed to a bug, doctors say you have a better chance of fighting it off if you have a strong immune system. All next week on the 700 Club, we'll be showing you ways to strengthen your immune system. The information will also be downloadable and on this DVD free of charge. Lori Johnson, CBN News. And of course, all of us here at CBN want you watching to stay strong and healthy. Pat, back to you. Uh, you know, I don't know if anybody's done an analysis, and it may be way off the wall, is the fact we had this flood of children coming across the border from Central America. Did they carry with them viruses that we were not familiar with in the United States and hadn't built up immunity to? It's entirely possible. I remember some years ago, uh, I was over in Romania, and uh, we were giving out toys at an orphanage. And those sweet little children, I had them sitting on my lap, and we were giving them presents and things, and they were so happy. Well, I got back. I wound up with a severe intestinal uh, mm. problem, and the doctor said, well, these children, he said it was the, it's the, the uh, well, if you will, uh, for this particular uh, intestinal bug. It's in these children. The mm -hmm. children had, a, had an immunity to it, but I didn't. Well, there seems to be a lot of questions still about what this is, how, where, where it comes well, from, how it, to contain it. it. Could have come, I mean, there were mm -hmm. thousands and thousands coming across the Rio Grande there, and then they were spread out in the states all across America. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, it, it's just one of those things. But I do know what happened to me trying to love up on those children. They're so sweet, and they, they get in your lap, and they, uh, you want to kiss them, and they want to kiss you, and they want to hug you, and all that other stuff. And it was beautiful, and we were giving them toys, and they were so happy. But uh, they left me with a, a little bug that, uh, you know, we had antibiotics for it, so it knocked it out pretty fast. But it's very unpleasant, and that's where it came from, according to my doctor, was was those little children in Central, I mean, in, in, in Eastern Europe. Well, one of the things we should all be doing at this point in time is to be strengthening our immune systems. And as Lori Johnson said, all next week we're going to be sharing the latest scientific information on staying strong and living long. If you're a Pledge Express member, you'll receive this DVD we've put together automatically. There's no need to call or write. Just watch for it in the mail. And you don't have to wait until next week to request your free DVD. Call now if you'd like to receive your copy of Protect Your Health. 
five ways to build a strong immune system. All you have to do is call 1-800-759-0700 and we'll send out your free DVD and I think you'll be very enthusiastic about the good news that's in there for you. Well, up next, actress Reese Witherspoon talks about her latest movie. The script was beautiful. It just really um, told the story of the Lost Boys of Sudan in a, in a beautiful way. The struggle of these children traveling thousands of miles across the desert just to find safety. You'll meet two of these children when we take you behind the scenes with the cast of The Good Lie after this. Ah. Okay. Get plenty of rest and follow all the instructions on here. Wow. Thank goodness for all those years of medical school, huh? Oh, I'm not a doctor, but I do watch the 700 Club. Protect your health and build a better, stronger immune system. The 700 Club brings you the latest steps to power up your well-being and boost your body's defenses. Experts from the Mayo Clinic. They're your body's first defense of getting rid of the bugs, germs, bacteria, viruses. The Cleveland Clinic. If they can't function, then they can't destroy anything foreign that's in the body. And many others show you how to live long and strong. Get your free DVD copy of Protect Your Health, Five Steps to a Healthier Immune System. Call 1-800-759-0700 or log on to CBN.com. Thanks. Protect Your Health. Hey. Available now. Flu season is around the corner. How are you protecting your health? We'll debut a new series, Building a Strong Immune System. I don't get colds like I used to. I've got more energy. I've lost over 20 pounds. We'll show you what you need to do to stay healthy. You're at a higher risk of developing ultimately other issues. Starting with a good night's sleep. That's your body's first response. Monday on The 700 Club. story of bravery, of courage, of perseverance, of hope. They're called the Lost Boys of Sudan. Thousands of young men who escaped the brutal civil war in that country by emigrating to America. Now there's a film based on their story. It's going to hit the theaters today. It's called, quote, The Good Lie. And as Ephraim Graham reports, it took producers 11 years to complete this epic more than 20,000 children escaped Sudan's deadly second civil war by walking thousands of miles to freedom. At least 4,000 of these lost boys of Sudan eventually made it to the United States. Gir Diwani is one of them. When the civil war came, find me there. When we have to go to Ethiopia by foot, that's the place where my journey really began, to Ethiopia in 1987. Seven years later, Dewani began high school in Des Moines, Iowa, earned a basketball scholarship, then became a fashion model and actor. His latest role... Hey, you're... Uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, right, right. Where, where are you going? To my home. ...is a fictional account on, of the Lost Boys' journey, adjustment to American life, and the unique bumps on the road. May I ask what credential is required to drive a car? Well, you need a driver's license. You, you practice, and then you uh, you pass a test. Oh, 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 slow down, slow down, slow down. Left, left, okay. Okay, now just stop. Whoa, put the brakes! Brakes! You okay? Oh, I think you should just stick to walking. We sat down with Duwani and his castmates before The Good Lies premiere. Gary, you actually are from South Sudan. You were a child soldier. You were a refugee. How true to reality is the film? I have so many titles <laughs> under my name. Yeah. Yeah, the story is very close to me. It came right from where I'm from. And in the center of it is our life experiences as a boys who really fled the country in 1987 by foot all the way to Ethiopia with no food to little. It was just a whole chaos it was going on in 1991, where sometimes I wonder if people knew about what was going on in 1991. And then here we are now, we're making movies about 1991 and the same problem is still going on. More than two million have died in Sudan's civil war. 
it's a statistic and a story that drew Academy Award-winning actress Reese Witherspoon to the project. You're giving me the check back in six months speech? She plays a counselor, helping three lost boys find jobs in Kansas City. Your character, if you could only describe her in one word, how would you describe her? Feisty. <laughs> Feisty. <laughs> so I'm going to try and get you more job interviews. It's not going to be easy. I have faith, Yardi. Yardi? This is a special name for you. For me? Yes. It had great cultural significance. What does it mean? It means great white cow. OK. Well, it's better than a lot of things I've been called. What is it about this role that made you want to do it? The script was beautiful. It just really um, told the story of the Lost Boys of Sudan in a, in a beautiful way, the struggle of these children traveling thousands of miles across the desert just to find safety. The film begins with a look at that harrowing escape. Sudanese children walking hundreds of miles, crossing bodies of water, braving heat exposure, and boys weren't the only ones to make the journey. Kuth Wheel makes her acting debut in this film. We may not know the exact day we were born. As the Lost what Boy's you know sister, Abatel. Brings me to you, Kuth. You actually are from Sudan. You were in a refugee camp. You lost your dad in the war in Sudan in 1993, right? I, I don't even know where to go. I mean, how do you act in this film knowing your personal history, I mean, that you, all that you've endured? Um, I mean, for me, besides my own personal history, I felt that um, it brought closure, in a sense, like for everyone that had gone through this. And it's still going through it today. And uh, it was a journey to learn about myself. Um, it's, it's so inspiring to see these children go through this and somehow come out of it laughing, in a sense. And um, I learned so much about my own history that I didn't necessarily know because I immigrated to the U.S. as a child. With such close ties to Sudan, the Good Lies cast hopes American audiences will learn and laugh at this story, ripped from the emotional pages of real life. I let my brother be taken away by soldiers instead of me. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Nashville, Tennessee. To protect me. That's a beautiful thing. Ladies and gentlemen, if you look back in history, what, I, I was over in Sudan with uh, Bush president number one, and uh, uh, the, it was the president, Numeri, who was in charge, and Sudan was a relatively peaceful place, and we had a lovely uh, reception, and he treated us very nicely, and it was just beautiful. We were in Khartoum. And then uh, a Muslim dictator took over and began to enforce Sharia law. And then he began to systematically wage genocide against the black people in the South. And along the way, there were Arab raiders who came in who themselves were Islamic. And uh, they, they uh, uh, came after them. And they were called the Janjui. And they came riding in on camels and shot up the villages for these poor people. And a lot of them. Black people were Muslim themselves, but it didn't matter. They weren't the kind that uh, uh, they weren't Arab Muslims, and so they were persecuted, and several million people died. And now they finally have South Sudan. Um, General Garang uh, organized uh, an organization that uh, uh, set up a country, and they have gotten independence from Sudan, but they're still fighting. And uh, these boys were the flotsam and jetsam that come about with this kind of warfare and this kind of uh, genocide. It was genocide, and they had to flee. And they, they fled into Ethiopia. And the trials and torments were beyond belief. And so my hat's off to Reese Witherspoon for doing this and those who were with her. It should be terrific. It's called The Good Lie. You ought to, you ought to see it because as these boys said, this stuff's still going on. It, it hasn't stopped. Terry? Yeah. I remember hearing stories of them adjusting to life in the United yeah, States. Yeah. I mean, just the capacity of the human spirit to endure yeah. is certainly well, I, I evident. Been speaking there. with the colloquial uh, English and, you know, slang and everything else, and you, you know, it's tough to pick up a foreign language the way they are, but they're so fluent in it. Now. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, coming up, another lost boy of Sudan who spent his childhood running for his life. I was dragged by a big 
guy with a lot of guns and was thrown in a truck. I, I wanted to be, you know, one of, one of those kids who just go to sleep and never wake up. Hear how he became a track star and the flag bearer for the United States Olympic team. That is next. I'm going back to school for my second degree, a Master's of Business Administration. Regent is definitely helping me on my path by giving me all of the tools and resources that I need to be successful in my career. The colleagues that I go to school here with and the professors all believe and share the same values that I do. The goal for me going to school is to set a strong foundation, not only within my career, but also in my family, and I set a good example in the community. Regent University, follow your path. A little word for Regent. Regent has about 6,000 people. It has students from over 50 states, 70 countries around the world. It's been named a top military-friendly university. It has gotten all kinds of recognition, and uh, it's a place where they're enrolling right now. And all you have to do is pick up the phone and call in, and enrollment is very easy these days. Uh, it's a uh, student-friendly school. And I think you will find it a wonderful experience. Undergraduate degrees in a number of disciplines, uh, seven or eight prestigious uh, uh, graduate degrees. And uh, the numbers on your screen is 1-800. It's different from, from the number we have here uh, for the 700 Club. It's uh, 2 one 0 Or you can log on to Regent EDU. And they're enrolling right now. And <clears throat> Every eight weeks, there's another enrollment period, so you don't have to wait very long. And mm -hmm. somebody's on the phone right now to talk to you. So it's that simple. Opportunity. Opportunity <laughs> to get, uh, you know, a lot of people want to finish their degree. You yes. know, they, they don't have a degree, and they've been in business or in the military or what have you, and you've got a place you can go online, study at home, and it's, it's terrific. All right. Well, distance runners know you need a ton of stamina and mental strength to make it to the finish line. American track star Lopez Lomang developed those two skills while living in a Sudanese refugee camp. Tom Beering has his inspiring story. I'm running this race, not for me, it's for them. I'm carrying this flag. I'm running for the children that don't have even moms, don't have parents don't have anybody to take care of them, to clothe them, to feed them if they're hungry, to give them a shoe. I am running for those kids, for those parents who are like, never have an opportunity to come here. Lopez Lamong was born in a small village in Sudan. When he was six, rebels snatched him from his mother's arms during a church service. I was dragged by a big guy with a lot of guns and bullets around him and were thrown in a truck. He was imprisoned at a rebel camp where he watched other young captives die. That's when he and three other boys planned their escape. They told me like, hey, t tonight we are going to see your mom again. In the dead of the night, Lopez slipped through a prison fence and ran for his life. We're trying to like run into the woods through the uh, savannah in a tall grass, it's like that, because we don't want anybody to be able to see us on, on above, on the hills and all these things, and we never had any, any food along the way. We just have fruits. Three days and 40 miles later, the Kenyan Border Patrol found little Lopez and took him to a refugee camp. It was his home for the next 10 years. His new enemies became disease, hunger, and despair. How often were you afraid that you were gonna lose your life? I, I wanted to be, you know, one of, one of those kids who just goes to sleep and never wake up. It's a survival of the fetus. You know, you have to be strong. You have to be, to be able to, to get that uh, half pickle of banana or spired canned food. And we all fighting for that. And that was our life. I'm just gonna go day by day, hour by hour. And I know that God is gonna give me an opportunity. And, and that's basically what, what I make me keep going. Lopez attended church services. He longed for a deeper relationship with God and wanted to be baptized. During a Christmas Eve service, he made a commitment to live like Jesus. I've been chosen, mm -hmm. and God wanted me to carry that cross and follow him. And how Jesus appointed his disciples, called them by name, 
and that's why I'm doing the God work. He began running the 18-mile perimeter of the refugee camp to meet the kids' self-imposed requirement to play in their soccer games. It served as a distraction. It's basically kept me away from thinking about my meal. And I mean, it's very, it's very tough to see that little rationing that you know that it's only you have to eat one meal a day. So running became something like I have to keep myself away from hunger. When Lopez turned 16, a remarkable opportunity opened. He was among 3,800 displaced kids chosen to live with families in the United States. Robert and Barbara Rogers became Lopez's American parents as part of the Lost Boys of Sudan program. I'm so blessed to be in this country. Me and my mom went to shop for school supplies. To have that backpack, to have that pencil, crayons, in my backpack at 16 years old so that I can be able to write something I remember afterward. It's just incredible. Lopez graduated from high school in nearby Tully, New York, where he ran on the track team. He earned a scholarship to Northern Arizona University and became an American citizen. He qualified for the 2008 Olympics in the men's 1500 meters and carried the U.S. flag in the opening ceremonies. Lopez won his first national title a year later at the 2009 USA Outdoor Track and Field Championships. He competes year-round internationally, never forgetting the thousands of remaining lost boys of Sudan still searching for homes. Now I'm running towards something. I'm running towards something to be able to give back to those kids, to give them opportunity, to give them that light for them, a future. You went to the United States and you told your story, basically, you, now you rescued all of us. God put us here for the reason and put me here to survive all these obstacles that I went through for the reason. Basically, to go out and help. Lopez lives and trains in Portland, Oregon. He authored the book, Running For My Life, to raise awareness of the plight of displaced children in Southern Sudan. Put everything in God's hand and follow what your heart, your heart and God relationship tells you to do. We all have different things that go through our lives. We all racing in our hearts in different ways. We all have things that we need to overcome. You just have to like step on that line and race. Get there, call God and say, hey, I'm here. Save me, forgive me. That's all, that's the race that we, we, we all need to do. Lopez won at the 2014 USA Indoor Championships and is training for the 2016 Olympics in Rio de Janeiro. The Olympic 5K runs 12 and a half laps. In the first six, runners share pacing and positioning. The next four require perseverance. But it's in Lopez's last lap and a half when he prepares to strike. Then in the final straightaway stretch, the focus is his alone. Oh God, help me. Just give me one more strength, 80 meters to go. And then you strike, strike hard. Basically that's when you just get and said, hey, I'm doing this for joy. I'm this, doing this for God. I'm doing it for everything that, I, that means so much to me. I'm running, closing my eyes, visualizing everything that I, how I went, went through. Running away from people like rocks, sticks, sticking on my, breaking into my skin while I was running barefoot with my Sunday best clothes that I had. Jesus did save me. And D Jesus did help me with my race. I'm not in the finish line yet. I'm just in the middle of the race. Lopez Lomong, what an inspiration. And you know, we're all in the middle of a race. He's got a great message for all of us, but continue to pray for Sudan. There are many, many children who are still in dire circumstances there. Pat? I looked at him, he's like, wouldn't you like to be able to run like that guy? Like the wind. <laughs> he, he's like the wind. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Those Africans always win those distance races. They win the marathons. Well, he's just, built for running. Oh, man. Well, anyhow, what a great story. Well, after their homes were destroyed and their neighbors killed, many of the refugees of South Sudan fled to the mountains to escape almost certain death. 
that's when Operation Blessing began working to keep them alive. Watch this. For many in South Sudan, there is still excitement surrounding their newly formed country. But for the refugees fleeing from the Nuba Mountains because of the ongoing fighting, life is still very hard. Operation Blessing is working to deliver food, medicine, clean water, and supplies to these displaced peoples who are fleeing there. We helped to load a chartered DC-3 in Nairobi, Kenya. Operation Blessing President Bill Horan jumped right in and told us more about the supplies we were flying into the country. Right now we've got tents, blankets, a water purifier, chlorine generator, 750,000 labendazole tablets to deworm kids. Once the plane landed, we didn't waste any time getting these critical supplies into the country and to the Nuba people seeking refuge in the mountains. For women and children like Batamas and her two-year-old daughter, they fled to the Nuba Mountains after nine days of intensive fighting in their village. Her home was destroyed. Her neighbors were killed. Their story is like so many others who were able to escape, but then lacked even the basics to survive until Operation Blessing came to their aid. You see, there's suffering. It's suffering because of the evil that men inflict on other human beings. But it happens. So what happens? We're the hand of the Lord extended. We can't help them all, but we're helping as many as we can. So that's another place that Operation Blessing is working to bring life-saving equipment. So what do you want to do about it? You can watch and say, well, isn't that sweet? Yes, you can say that, or you can say, I want to do something. And it's so easy. We're making it so easy for people. You can join the 700 Club. That's just 65 cents a day. And you can be a part of helping. And we, we have orphans, uh, orphanages. We, Terry's involved in Orphan's Promise. We have a relief going on at earthquake victims and tsunami victims and things here in the United States where people are poor. It's not just overseas. It's all around the world. And well, it's just, it's a thrill to be able to do that. Now, for those who participate, uh, we have had really nice response for this, the Psalms of Encouragement. I had no idea when I did them that they'd be this, <laughs> this popular. <laughs> but Terry, people like people these. People are looking for encouragement, for hope, for yeah. a good word from the Lord, and the, the Psalms are a place to psalms find Psalms of encouragement, selective Psalms, and, and uh, I've had the privilege of reading them. And we will give this to everybody who not only makes a pledge, but makes the pledge and says, well, I'm going to please put it on Pledge Express which means your financial institution does the work. We'll tell you how to do it, no problem. But uh, if you want this, join the 700 Club or something else, the 700 Club Gold or whatever, and we'll send you Psalms of Encouragement if you join Pledge Express. Terry. Well, still ahead, we've got your email questions. Lorena says, I have an unsaved friend <clears throat> who mocks me and others. I know it's a sin to mock God, but what about mocking others? You'll hear Pat's response. That's coming up. CBN presents Psalms of Encouragement. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Our gift to you when you join Pledge Express. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. A man's wife and son vanish along with millions of others in the rapture. It's the cataclysmic scenario in the new movie Left Behind starring Nicolas Cage. Alec Ramey and other actors also appear in the film based on the popular Left Behind book series, and they told CBN News why they chose the part. You can find those interviews on CBNNews.com. Left Behind opens in theaters nationwide today. 
Operation Blessing is helping provide safe water for families in Guatemala. Families in the village of Alutenango only had access to water for one hour each week. But before they could fill their containers, the water would run dry and there was never enough for everyone. Sonia's family had to use their meager income to buy bottled water. Operation Blessing helped the village set up a system to store the available water in catchment tanks, which is then gravity fed to houses in the village. Now Sonia's family and many others have access to enough water to meet their needs. That's great to hear. And you can find out more about Operation Blessing by going to their website at ob.org. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, it's time to bring it on with your email questions. And Pat, this first one is from Lorena, who says, I have an unsaved friend who mocks me and others. I know it's a sin to mock God, but what about mocking others? He doesn't just make fun. He literally mocks what they do right to their faces and sometimes behind their backs. Now, the Bible says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. But you know, they cursed Jesus, they mocked Jesus, they uh, spit on Jesus, they slapped his face. He's the Son of God. And uh, when it was all over and he was at the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. I think that's the attitude of a Christian. Forgive them, they know not what they do. But uh, there's one scripture that I would put in the mind of somebody who gets mocked. You just say it to them. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Don't say anything. Don't argue. Just say it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. That will go into their minds. They'll go home at night, and they'll say, wow. And, and one of these days, it will come home. But, but you show love. You don't strike back. You, you know, that's, what, that's what turn the other cheek is all about. All right. Okay, this is Destiny who says, Is it true that everyone's destiny is not heaven? In Matthew 7, 22, 23, Jesus says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I want to be among the saints and behold God's glory as a true Christian. How can I avoid God's denial and do I have to keep repenting? I'm sure of my faith and I take Jesus' words of life to be true. Help me with this struggle. Well, why do you struggle? Why don't you rest in the Lord? You're doing what He asked you to do. You believe in Him. You have trusted Him. Give Him your life and let, let Him take charge of it. Jesus is, what did he say about those people? He said, those who do the will of my Father in heaven, not those who make a big show. They're people who make a big show about their religiosity, and basically he said they're going to hell. So no, not everybody's going to heaven. Uh, he made very clear that there was a hell to shun and there was a heaven to gain. And uh, when this life is over, that's it. There's no soul sleep and there's no turning back. I want to make it very clear to everybody watching this show. The Bible is clear. This life is it. And the decisions you make now have eternal consequences and eternity is where we're all going. So trust in the Lord. You trust in the Lord, the Lord will take care of you. So, so relax in Him and praise your, raise your hands and praise Him. One last question. This is Jean who says, sometimes my husband does not want to be intimate with me. He tells me God is telling him to be celibate. What should I do? Well, you tell him to read the Bible. The Bible says, uh, don't withhold sex from the partner. He said the wife's body belongs to the husband, the husband's body belongs to the wife, and they can come apart occasionally for fasting and prayer. But beyond that, uh, the normal relation is sexual relations between man and woman. That was blessed by God. And if your husband is playing these games, he doesn't know the Bible. But read it carefully. Get the letters of Paul. See what he has to say. And uh, he said, do not withhold mm -hmm. from one another. So uh, women have needs. Men have needs. And the Lord has ordained marriage that they would uh, satisfy one another. It says it in the Bible, very clear. So I'm afraid your husband doesn't read enough, Terry. 
Well, up next, a wife and mother hooked on painkillers. You shut yourself off from the world. Your personal hygiene, it affects that. You don't want to go outside. I ended up losing all of it. Um, my career, the home to foreclosure, um, marriage. Watch how she gets her life back after this. Every waking minute, Cheryl Edwards obsessed about pain pills. Her addiction ruled her life and ultimately her son's life too. Until the night, Cheryl had a terrifying vision that she was killing her own child. First thing I would do when I was in my addiction is I would reach for a pill. I was, I mean, there were times when I would be in my sleep thinking about, you know, waking up and taking a pill. That's what you go to bed thinking about and that's what you wake up thinking about. Cheryl Edwards' addiction to painkillers was controlling her life and destroying her marriage. You really don't realize how much you, addiction will do. Cheryl was a popular radio personality in the Chicago area. She married Mark, a friend from high school who had since become a Christian. Cheryl was raised in the church and her parents were Christians. I believed I was saved through their faith when I looking back on it. That it takes more than that, you know. Though both had children from previous marriages, everything seemed to be falling in place. One Thanksgiving, the two were on their way to Memphis to see her father, and the weather turned treacherous. An 18-wheeler thought I was gonna go through the yellow light, and I stopped, and it, it took our truck out. I woke up three days later and had a broken neck. Cheryl and Mark both recovered, but for Cheryl, the greatest damage would come long after the accident. As a result the, from those injuries, um, they loaded me up on painkillers. I came back home uh, to Rockford where I was given more painkillers. The prescriptions kept getting refilled and Mark became concerned. Our doctor was giving us an outrageous amount of pills. It was crazy. I thought it was acceptable because it, was com it came prescribed by a doctor. Um, I thought it was okay. Then Mark and Cheryl noticed her supply of pills was dwindling faster than it should. They discovered her son, Stephen, had been taking them. One day, he seemed to be sick, so Cheryl gave him a pill, thinking it would help him wind down. I thought I was taking care of my son. I, he needed me. I, he was going through withdrawals. Soon, both mother and son were addicted to prescription drugs. You shut yourself off from the world. I mean, you don't want to go outside your personal hygiene, it affects that. I ended up divorcing Mark. I ended up losing all of it. Um, my career, the home to foreclosure, um, marriage. The only thing that kept me from being out on the street was my mother. One night, Cheryl was about to give Stephen another dose. God showed me a vision. A vision of myself holding Stephen and hand feeding him pills as a baby. And I had never seen myself in that light before. When I saw myself hand feeding him pills, I thought I'm killing my child. That vision was the turning point for Cheryl, who turned her life over to Christ. We always think that we gotta clean up first, you know, or, or not, we'll never be good enough or something, but that's not true. I really surrendered my life to, to the Lord that night in the, in the bedroom after the Lord showed me what I had done. Cheryl knew she had to get herself and her son into rehab, but it was very expensive. So she began praying for a way to pay for it. One day, she saw an ad in the paper. I came across an ad that said, are you or someone you love addicted to painkillers? And I shared my, our story. The ad was for an upcoming episode of The Oprah Winfrey Show that featured parents and children who were both addicts. After Cheryl and Stephen, along with Cheryl's daughter Veronica, appeared on the show, Harpo Productions agreed to pay for their rehab. When I got out, it was just so alarming to see how many people were addicted. Although they were divorced, Mark was supportive of Cheryl through her entire treatment. Afterwards, they were watching an episode of The 700 Club. There was a segment on about Bill and Carolyn Reeser. Their story was a lot like ours. In the segment, uh, Carolyn Reeser tells Bill, her husband, if God can forgive you, I can too. And it just, it just spoke to Mark and I. We both broke down crying. It was just such a beautiful story how God had given her the strength to do this. 
Mark and Cheryl were inspired by the Reeser story and believed God could restore their marriage as well. They were remarried in 2010. This time around, God is at the center of their relationship. When we can find it in ourselves through God to love those who aren't loving us back, I believe that makes God smile, and I like to make God smile. Today, I wake up and I think about you know, the Lord and my family. The Lord wants you wherever you're at in your life. The, the Bible, script, the scripture, um, he reached down from on high and took a hold of me and drug me out of deep waters. You know, the Lord rescued me and he can do that to you. She's so right, the Lord wants you and maybe you don't feel very worth loving, worth wanting, worth having, but God sees you right where you are. He just loves you too much to let you stay there. But trust him, trust him. He's got a plan for your life. He's the great I am. Everything that you need, every desire you have, every physical need that you have, every financial need that you have, he is your all in all. So don't wait to get your act together. You and I can't get our act together. We can never do enough to be righteous before God. He's not asking us for that. He's asking us to obey him and he says, let me help you. That's God's heart cry. Let him help you right where you're at. What does it mean? It means you surrender your life to him. It means you acknowledge you've blown it. We all have. The Bible says there's not one that's righteous, that no one, no one is. But we can come before him because of the sacrifice of Jesus. We are covered by the blood of the lamb. And so God sees us through the filter of Jesus Christ. And he says, you're mine. He gives us his name. What does it require? Letting go, surrender, just saying, Jesus, I want to be yours. I receive your forgiveness. I want to know you. I want to live my life for you. We're just passing through here on our way to eternity. This is the test. This is the test. And it's so simple. Just say yes. If you'd like to know more about what it means to be a Christian and what do you do after you surrender to Christ, Pat's put together a great little packet called A New Day. It's free. We'd love to send it to you. All you have to do is call that toll-free number, 1-800-759-0700. Just say, I'd like to receive Jesus today, and I'd like the New Day packet. We will get this sent out to you right away. So please call now and remember that you don't have to get good enough to come to Jesus Christ. He paid the price for you. His love is there for you. And today, he's waiting for you to respond to his invitation. Just say yes. Pat. A wonderful word. Well, we leave you with today's power minute. It's taken from Psalm 31. How great is the goodness you have stored up for those who fear you. You lavish it on those who come to you for protection, blessing them before the watching world. Well, on Monday, you're going to learn the secret to a good night's sleep. Our Protect Your Health series is going to kick off next week, how to preserve your immune system and stay healthy. I think you don't want to miss one episode. And so for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you for being with us. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you on Monday. Bye-bye.